So our last presentation is um, going to be joint. Uh, Francesca Bonino, um, who's uh, I think most people know. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't know Francesca from, from, from all that? Um, she, you know, covers evaluation, learning, um, and accountability research um, for ALMAP. And <coughs> my colleague, Isabella Jean, who is the Director of Learning and Evaluation at CDA. And they, for the last year and a half, I guess, have been working together um, to uh, do the, some case studies and to put together this um, this uh, summary and guidance that has just, just come out um, on what makes humanitarian feedback mechanisms uh, effective. Granted, it's, it's three case studies, but hopefully I think with, it's also been looking at a lot of other examples from other people in the literature as well. Um, and they're uh, going to, to share a bit of that, and I think there are copies hopefully in the back um, as well. And I just want to mention it's really great to have um, Manuel Pereira, who is with IOM in Pakistan, um, and hosted them um, in the three case studies were Lupathi's program and in uh, Darfur, uh, the IOM uh, and the shelter cluster programming in Pakistan, and then with IFRC in Haiti. Um, and so it's great to have two of the three um, people, uh, at least in the room, um, who can also share a little bit more when we have discussions. And I just wanted to mention that Sharon is here, who, and she presented oh, on right. IFRC's um, oh, beneficiary uh, communications program yesterday, yesterday, which was the third case study. Um, thank you, Dana. I'm, I'm here and I'm going to start uh, uh, this presentation that I'm sharing uh, with Isabella and also to emphasize how special it is to have in the room, how unique it is and special for me and Isabella having worked on this for two years and um, to have the host of our case study and the three agency who volunteer to have us uh, and take us around and really opening the door to both their staff uh, in their offices and also uh, facilitate our meetings with the, with the community. Um, what I'm going to uh, talk about in this presentation, let me see it. It's um, basically I would want to give you an idea of what is different about this presentation and about this actual research that we have done. I would want to introduce, if you bear with me, um, just one slide with definition. How did we define feedback loop and a feedback mechanism? Very often the terms are used and the concise definition, precise definition are left implicit. And thirdly, between me and Isabella, we are going to share six main findings based uh, collectively <coughs> on the analysis that we have done based on the country case study. So our main question was, what makes feedback mechanism in humanitarian context effective? What makes them work? And I'm really pleased that we are actually coming as a third uh, presenter, because uh, uh, both Luz and Lupate, they have actually touched on a lot of the keywords that you will see explained and presented in the guidance <coughs> document. Um, and so uh, this makes also quite interesting the discussion in terms of validation also from other agencies and other experience. What we have done and what makes this action research different? We wanted to go back to the affected population and the F and aid recipients and ask feedback to them on the feedback mechanism. So if you wish, it's a feedback loop or about the feedback loop. We wanted to ask them what is their perception of how these mechanisms are established and used by agencies in different contexts. It was also very important for us to triangulate what we heard from crisis affected people with agency staff, as Lupate was mentioning, it is also important to do some groundwork within the agency, among the frontline staff, so that they are also aware why we are doing this. And the second element that makes our action research different is that we wanted to concentrate not only on the data collection element, which is very important to trigger the feedback loop so that you actually collect uh, um, issues, comments, suggestions from uh, uh, the program participants you work with, but also, very importantly, and this was an element that from the literature review appear to be very neglected, we wanted to focus on how feedback information is used for day-to-day -day program improvement, especially, mid-course correction, which I think it's also what Luz was emphasizing, and day-to-day -day, uh, running of the program. So this was our scope. How feedback data is used to inform decision making and make program changes, especially on a day-to-day, -day, even mid-course correction. So these were the, the two key features that we embedded in the methodology we used uh, for this case study. Mm -hmm. Based on the three field visit, we have analyzed this data using a pattern matching approach. It is all explained in the, in the methodology. In a nutshell, we try to detect whether there is any pattern between 
some features of the feedback mechanism that we observe in the country mm. and whether this feature also correlates with those mechanisms that are perceived by affected population as more effective. Mm. So this was the analysis so that we tried to come up with a practitioner guidance which is what you have here, that is as much as possible based on evidence that has been triangulated across, across cases and based on uh, uh, desk-based and literature review. So I'm afraid now I am going to come to the one slide which is about definition, just to get the terminology right. Yesterday, John Mitchell had a presentation from our background paper, mm -hmm. and he also hinted to how important it is the taxonomy and the definition of the term. You remember he had the engagement error. And he spent a few minutes just giving a definition of exactly where we are, when are we talking about uh, these different uh, issues. And feedback loop, feedback mechanism, what is a closed and open feedback loop means, are often left as implicit definition. And so our definition is that a feedback mechanism for us is a set of procedures and tools formally I'm going to go back to formally, established and used to allow humanitarian aid recipients and in some cases other crisis affected population to provide information on their experience of a humanitarian agency or perhaps even of the broader humanitarian system. That was the case of the listening project, for instance. So that feedback mechanism can also function as part of broader monitoring practices, case of uh, both IOM and um, uh, Pakistan and Sudan World Vision. They can also collect a variety of information that can be used for different purposes, including taking corrective actions to improve some elements of the humanitarian response. A feedback loop is seen as effective if, at minimum, it supports the collection, acknowledgement, and analysis, very important, of the feedback that is received. And whether or not the issue at stake is resolved, as the example of the ground nut oil or the smelling oil from Sudan, <coughs> whether or not you can bring a resolution to the issue or the query that is bringing your attention, if you go back relying some response and explanation back to the community, that is a case where we and Isabella, we were documenting, this is an example of a closed feedback loop. And here we come to the six findings that we selected for you so that we could share some of the highlights from uh, uh, the analysis we conducted that is reflected in the guidance. So the question that we had that informed our research is what makes feedback mechanisms work? Yeah. And the first is that formal is not always better. <laughs> formal is not always better. <laughs> Which goes against the purpose of what we started to research because feedback mechanisms we design as a formal set of procedure. Yep. This is what we try to test in the field. Is it always true? What we find out is that actually, you may already have some mechanism, some practices, some participatory practices already embedded in how your program is working, how your program is designed, and you may already get the information that you need from your um, from the community you work with, you may already get this information from other channels. And so the desire to formalize mm -hmm. should be really carefully judged and assessed against the, the purpose of what is the additional information that I don't get currently from what I have already in place with my community in terms of two-way communication, participatory monitoring and evaluation. If you already get the information that you need, then our <coughs> suggestion would be strengthen what you have and don't just formalize just for the sake of adding new communication tool because it would go against the purpose of your feedback mechanism. And now I'm going to pass <coughs> on to Isabella, who is going to proceed with uh, sharing with you more findings. Great. Thanks, everyone. And just to note, there are 15 um, findings in the guidance, and we're only presenting six here. Mm -hmm. And we really urge you to look through the guidance document. In terms of... Um, you know, in a setup and a design stage, of course, we focused quite a bit on that, and the staff uh, who were involved there from the beginning and who were running the mechanisms at the point of our visit had quite a bit to say retrospectively on what was uh, learned on a setup and a design of the mechanism. Um, a huge piece of it is really being clear about the purpose, the why. Why are we doing this? Who is, what is this for? Who is this for? And um, obviously, um, managing the expectations right from the start. And to do this well, you really have to consult with both the agency-based users, the users within your own organizations, at all levels, 
not just people who will be sorting it, but the senior managers, the decision makers, mm -hmm. and of course the users of the mechanism in the affected communities, the people who will in fact be interfacing with the feedback mechanism on a potentially daily basis. So this uh, issue around communicating the purpose, how it will function, and what to expect from the feedback process is very critical right from the start, and I'll also keep communicating it. Um, we had a graphic um, a design, uh, an illustrator who actually did this original drawings based on the case study text, so it's been really wonderful to work with him. Um, the other piece that we wanted to um, you know, emphasize, and of course nothing new, not a flashpoint, is really um, paying attention and allocating enough time at the, at the design stage to consider all the various factors to make the feedback channels appropriate and accessible to a variety of actors in the community. So things like accessibility by gender, financial cost, if it's an SMS system, can people afford it, is it going to be free, you know, all the various things, I won't go into detail, as well as concerns around anonymity and confidentiality for potentially sensitive topics, but also if people want to remain anonymous while uh, complaining or uh, making suggestions around staff conduct and other issues. I will echo what Luz already said. People in every single place we visited prefer multiple channels. We heard this repeatedly from different people at different levels in the community, um, leaders, um, women, uh, marginalized people, people in committees. Everybody um, truly appreciated the face-to-face -face contact, which continues to be an option even while other systems have been set up. Suggestion boxes, call centers, SMS-based systems and so on. Um, so it really cannot be, you know, should not be replaced. The other piece, of course, is resources. How much does this cost? What do we need to really think about when we're setting up mm -hmm. feedback mechanisms and the various resource implications? Um, it's, it's clear from all of our interviews with staff and, and uh, senior management in, in the agencies that planning ahead and allocating sufficient resources to how the data will be sorted, analyzed, verified, all the various steps that are incredibly important for this to actually be useful and actionable for decision makers. Analysis is particularly an important piece and a big gap and a weak, weak point in many of the feedback mechanisms, just something we know from literature review as well. Um, the piece around developing analytical capacity to actually process and make sense of the data that you are that you are collecting and interpret it and be able to um, offer it in a usable format. As well as hiring staff who can do this well and appropriately based on um, being able to reach women, minorities, different language groups, marginalized groups and so on. So this is a really important piece, especially when it comes to face-to-face -face contact. Um, the flexibility to change, a very critical point. Our focus on utilization was really um, an important piece that brought out this reflection in, in a retrospective um, reflection on how feedback is actually being used for um, decision making. And one statement that we, we are making in the guidance very confidently, because it also echoes every single um, uh, person that we've talked to within the agency, is that if you don't have flexibility to modify your programs, if you just know right from the start that there's almost no margin, no margin for any kind of tweaking or changes, you really shouldn't <coughs> be um, asking a broad, um, you know, a broad um, feedback because that goes against the purpose of establishing an effective mechanism. You have to work on both collecting the data and also making that margin wider and continuously advocating for the ability to use feedback to make course corrections. So uh, designing a feedback mechanism that in fact provides reliable and timely information to program staff um, for decision making and making it actionable is, is a really important piece where um, staff at various levels, not just in meal teams and program teams, but also at the, at the decision making level both at the country and uh, headquarters and wherever else and others, implementing partners, others who have some decisions to make on how they would adjust the programming, really need to understand um, what they can expect and how they can use this data, including things like changes in strategy at the higher level, 
um, changes in program design, and using feedback data for advocacy. Really interesting examples to box from using feedback data, even in Darfur, which is a rather restricted environment for advocacy at the country at the, in, in Khartoum around increasing more live, uh, more funding for livelihoods and so on. Um, so we, we've got some really interesting examples on that as well. If you, in case you can't see, um, the person sitting in a chair says, I have decision making powers but no responsibility for managing <coughs> feedback and uh, the person collecting <coughs> data is responsible for managing feedback but have no decision making authority. Um, this point is an important one. We have not resolved this. We raised this question very, um, uh, you know, straightforwardly, both in the synthesis document, in the research study, and in the guidance. Where do you locate this feedback function in your organization? Where does it sit in your organic ground? Really matters. However, we haven't done enough case studies, and we haven't had enough of a uh, of evidence to actually come up with a, a specific model to, to advocate for a particular model. Mm -hmm. Should it sit within the program teams? Should it sit as a separate meal team? Should it be embedded? We've seen all kinds of setups and there are advantages and disadvantages in all of them. Mm -hmm. Happy to discuss them. Mm -hmm. I think it's really an open question still. And of course, the, the main finding on um, closing the feedback loop is that there needs to be a response. The, the data needs to be utilized. And um, you have to really pay attention to both solicited feedback and unsolicited feedback. Uh, the suggestions, the complaints of feedback that arrive to you through various other means without you actually asking through these informal means. Where things that you set up yourself might actually just displace some already existing feedback across the channels that um, the means feel more comfortable using. On the decision making, I've already mentioned some of these points, but it really takes some uh, planning ahead and thinking ahead <laughs> on who within your organization needs the information, how frequently, in what format, um, how will they be using it, and what exactly can you do, how can you shape this, this data in terms of trends, like what Lupata produces based on his database queries, trends across several months, across a year, what does this mean, what, how do we make sense of this, and actually having these conversations, having a standing agenda item in and, and your you know, staff meetings, who needs to hear it, and so on. A, a really important point, I think, that gets missed on, on some of the design and setup uh, decisions that I made. So much is spent on how we're going to collect the data and not enough on how we're going to analyze it, who needs to hear it, how we're going to actually use it, and making that the routine process. And actually creating demand for feedback within your agency so that your senior decision makers are demanding it, not just for reporting, reporting and accountability purposes, uh, going up, but actually for their use, for their decision making purposes. And finally, our sixth finding is please share your lessons, your, your tools, your, um, you know, your failed attempts at do this. To, uh, doing this within your own um, larger organizations, with your implementing partners, with cluster members, um, share the resources, uh, and of course refer the feedback itself. Uh, that's another huge piece on, on how information is shared. I just want to point out that uh, if you have questions to Lubate um, on how the, the feedback is used and the food assistance program there, the internal communication and information loops that exist within the food assistance program in World Vision so that are as important as what happens in the feedback collection with communities. What he does with the food distribution managers is on an everyday basis to keep sharing information internally is equally important in the setup of this whole system. So it's a really critical point and um, I'll stop there. Thank you and we're open for questions. Great. Great. So, are there any questions for clarification on the presentation or the guidance? I'm Tendik Tinestana from with the British uh, Red Cross. Thank you very much, you know, for the presentation, but also for the study. Uh, my question is really quick, and, and, and it is mainly for clarification. In your study, have you come across the issue of distinction between feedback and complaints at all? This was a huge issue at the beginning because mm -hmm. especially in the literature, a lot of the literature generated on the subject 
of complaints response mechanism, feedback mechanism, and um, com uh, complaints and response mechanism was driven by a lot of the early work, excellent <coughs> and still very, very, um, uh, very, very relevant today. A lot of the research conducted by HAP. One of the standards that is precisely about complaints, the focus. The National Refugee Council Complaints Manual, excellent resource. The focus of the literature is the literature is mainly on complaints. Feedback tend to tended to be um, there a bit as an add-on. Yes. So we wanted to be quite clear in our scoping decision, the one that we took at the beginning before going to the field and documenting the different experience, that we were actually looking at uh, um, feedback mechanisms, so mechanisms that were dealing with day-to-day -day questions related to implementation and not a suggestion issue for consideration, so which is our definition of feedback, and not only or not exclu exclusively to issues that may have legal even implication for mismanagement, wrongdoing, embezzlement, if I'm, if I'm looking at money, lots so of issues that may have legal <laughs> 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 I'm speaking at the Shelter Cluster and uh, I learned Pakistan. So there is specifically a double case law. There is a case law that is often dealt uh, for more serious uh, serious issues that are complaints, and that is often handled in a different way. So if you imagine there is a flowchart when uh, the information comes to your agency doorstep, there is often some sort of triage happening. And if there are information, for instance, in terms of allegation of sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, mismanagement, staff misbehavior. This would be handled in a different way and there are often procedures that are better uh, formed and even more accepted because complaints handling has a longer history of being documented with dedicated staff. I'm thinking protection staff, uh, the protection cluster in many settings or sexual exploitation abuse um, advisor. So we focused on feedback. And then there is a, a second issue. So there is one about uh, definition, case law, and literature that is not often um, uh, that's very thin on feedback. And then there is a second issue that uh, Lupat actually introduced. In certain <coughs> contexts, the issue of complaints and, and feedback has a political connotation. It's quite charged. And so in terms of acceptability of your system, you may have to present it in a way, as uh, Lupat has done in Sudan, where you are defining and um, presenting it as a feedback mechanism because complaints um, may put you in a situation where authorities may feel that you are replacing them or it is their role, and Pakistan is often the case. De facto, these are complaints, but the, the mechanism, it's called a feedback mechanism because it gains more acceptability. Other questions? I'm interested in the experience of the panel in looking at feedback mechanisms in, um, in oper uh, operational areas where we're managing remotely. I'm thinking specifically of Syria at the moment. I'm just interested in any, any learning that came out from research or any practical experience that can be shared as well. My um, uh, yeah, former colleague, uh, Kim, uh, who is sitting just there, because he conducted a mini case study for the Humanitarian Innovation Fund. Uh, in Somalia, you can talk a little bit about it, it's also mentioned in the publication, because that was the case of Danish Refugee Council, community-based uh, reconstruction program, if I'm correct, and uh, they, have, they, are, they have been using an, an SMS-based feedback mechanism, which received funding from the HIF, so this would be one literature source. Uh, secondly, um, I think there has been more experience that unfortunately it's not documented among some of the UK DEC agencies mm -hmm. who are operating in Syria mm -hmm. and who are starting to discuss with their operational team how operating in a remote environment can still offer opportunities, for instance using some of the SMS based or even radio um, uh, based tool uh, to get in touch with population that are hard to reach. Unfortunately that is not often documented. Uh, perhaps, Kim, do you have anything, any other experience on the, the remote? Well, we actually issued the Hill Commission to get abroad to take us with it in Afghanistan, which is looking at reviewing the range of remote monitoring and accountability approaches, uh, which was being used by agencies uh, and I can share that with people. The experience in this knowledge from the RCP was, uh, was using SMS and feedback. Uh, but I think what's important there is it wasn't a standalone system, it was uh, integrated into a program which was based on a large mm -hmm. level of integration of the
Yes. And I forgot, definitely also another HIF grantee was actually Tier Fund in Afghanistan. Some of the most comprehensive and, and documented well-researched piece was from Bryony Norman, who was the disaster management uh, team leader in Afghanistan, who has written about uh, participatory and uh, remote and many practices in, in Afghanistan. And so that is also another piece that you can share. Yeah. And uh, it's on the HIF website. Yeah. And I um, specifically for Syria, uh, if you remember in the in the presentation, the, the bubbles about the minimum quality information, that was a distillation uh, that was very required for the Oxfam programs because one of our strategies to work inside Syria is to work with a very heterogeneous and broad variety of organizations. Some of them are literally neighbors that have put together, that have got together to make uh, collective soups, like in the Latin America style. So it was um, no the, the one before. Um, so it was um, extremely interesting. Uh, according to the feedback I got on the training that we did with some of these partners, to get uh, like a simple way to explain um, why this is component is important and what type of information would be relevant for us in terms of of people's perceived needs and level of satisfaction. So basically, at the end of the day, I think it was Save the Children precisely that you had an excellent piece on humanitarian at the crossroad, where uh, maybe it was even you saying at the end of the video, uh, how can we say we do a good job unless we know, at least have a remote idea of uh, if people are satisfied and happy with our work or not. It comes down to that.